Um, this is an interactive, organic discussion. We've got some topics that we're going to go over. Um, but again, we're, we're ready to be approached with questions and comments, you know, like, uh, we're only as smart as all of us together, you know? Uh, all right, I guess we'll start off by introducing ourselves. My name is William Menzies. Um, I started Flow Magazine back in like 2002, which is like the, uh, the industry journal for glass blowers. And I also uh, invented the Helix, and I'm one of Bob Snodgrass's apprentices, so that's my lineage. Uh, my name is Christian Gazneri. I go by Chocolate Glass. Um, I'm an independent artist in Portland, Maine. I've been working for Glass about 15 years now. Well, I from all those wonders. Um, I'm a distributor for 10 years now and I own a shop for four years in Boston. Y'all should uh, get a hold of this guy because he carries some dope ass glass. Eli Mize, I've had a a booth at the oldest market in the country, outdoor market at the Saturday market for 20 years. I was the teacher at the University of Oregon for glass, and uh, I wrote a book on glass. It's called the Contemporary Shot Glass that is about how the shot glass disappeared. So uh, yeah, you guys can check me out right when you get in the door. I'm Zach Wiener with Stoke CT, Stoke in Connecticut. Um, we're a gallery, a shop, uh, a uh, studio, a working studio, uh, try to hit in as many aspects of the industry as possible. I'm the other half of Stoke CT. My name is Charlie Ramos. Oh. All right. Thank you. Again, thank you all so much for showing up because I guarantee we learn more from you than you might learn from our little small amount of knowledge. So again, thank you all. <laughs> All right, so what we're here to talk about is shaping like, our, our interests. Like, I know y'all have a lot of things going on. Y'all got creative and y'all got consumables, y'all got the things, but like for us, we want to talk about shaping the future of the American art class because that's what's important to us. And obviously you all are involved in that or you wouldn't be here. So again, um, we just want to hit some topics on, you know, and like shit's getting tougher. Shops are popping up all over the place. And so the game has to be on point you know, for us to continue to thrive in this space. So that's what we're here to talk about. Yep. So we, have, we got some topics. It's very organic, again, you know, um, but we'll, we got a loose guideline that we're gonna go by, and here we go. First topic that we have, which like is the bane of every shop owner, I swear to God, is employee training and employees. Like, what a tough spot is human resources, right? So, actually, we'll put it to the floor, we'll put it to you guys, actually, you know, talking about that. Well, I guess, I think, like, you know, this, this whole topic, the very beginning, is, is the hiring process. Yeah. And that's, that's super important. Um, when we look for somebody to hire, we try and look for somebody who's passionate about what we do, you know. So, if, you're going to get a lot of people that come into the shop or, or brick and mortar, um, and they're, just looking for a job. They're looking for a part-time job, and they just walk in because that's what you know people do when they're looking for that type of position. Um, but we take it much more seriously than that, you know. And one of the things I always look for in an employee is, I think, you know, I ask them how, what's their social media activity? You know, how much, how many glass blowers do they follow? Um, Essentially, what do you do when you wake up in the morning? Do you turn on your phone and, and pay attention to what we do uh, as a business? And if they do, that's right away like a, a good sign, and then we can continue from there. Uh, but passion is is the first starting point. Well, what kind of experiences have y'all had as far as employees, like you know, good and or bad, the good, the bad, and the ugly? Anyone? Because I know my brother. My brother. Oh, yeah, we got somebody. Yes, please. Okay. Um, and just from working there, just seeing the employees that come to the art team, as you recently cycled through a lot of employees, and what you're saying for passion, like we've had people who come in just to do a job and have no idea what they walked into or anything about any of the products. And in the shop, I would look specifically the employees hire employees. If our owners are just going to take care of that sort of thing, um, you trust in me and one of our other employees that's been there a while. Right. 
who are dedicated and involved in this industry. Um, but yeah, I would approach some of your like better suppliers. Like I know that we've worked with particular uh, shops to where we provide a, a this, you know, for a month contest for how many helix can you sell in a month for the employees, and then we just kick them down something dope, and it doesn't cost you all anything except the effort to actually institute that program. You know, so like you can work with the people that are your vendors to help provide some of that incentive, so you're not taking it out of pocket. I mean, I've, I've definitely brought my employees up to three at a time to age and before Las Vegas was going, and I have a bonus structure, but I also feel sometimes it's unfair because people, not so much, back in the day, in October and November, people would come over from over the hill with a pocket full of cash and drop three grand. Oh, back in hardest season, of course. Yeah, that doesn't really happen anymore, you know. Yeah. Our, our whole community's changed, our whole that, structure of what Mendocino is has, yes. has changed. This well, entire yeah. space has changed in the last two to three years. This entire space has changed tremendously. Sure. Yeah. I've been open for eight. I'm going on nine years in May, so yeah. That's good. You're in it to win it. Yeah. Sometimes I do the team in center, so that way it, it accumulates a whole week or something like that, just so that everybody gets something. Could, could you say that one more time, please, a little louder? Sometimes I do, like, a team, like, Incentive. Include so, everyone? Yes, yeah, so that okay. based on how many hours they worked, because some of my people are part time, some are full time. Yeah. But like sometimes you just want to do you it's the luck of the draw when somebody comes in and drops like mad money and then only one person has a shot at selling that. But if it's the whole week or a whole time period, then at times it can be team building. Yeah. Yes, we're together. We're all trying that right. Week. And then it just gets them reinforcing the skill to upsell. I don't care if it's like a pack of papers on a dude too, but it yeah. gets everybody kind of re-motivated. It's more collaborative versus competition based. Yeah. Nice. And they're all going to benefit. Nice. That's very good. I think that's a super important part because you, you're not building competition within your right. own Right. You don't community. want them backbiting on each other. You don't want them. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Anybody else? Yes, please. Yeah, um, I just wanted to mention something. I mean, so Bring it on, man. Yeah, so let me know. Um, I've been, I, I'm new to all this, so thank you guys for letting me come off. Thank that. you for coming. Um, I'm more traditionally trained in sales. I mean, it's less the passion line. But you um, smoke weed. Oh, no, that's right. <laughs> so, yeah. One thing I think is, uh, you know, very overlooked, and I'm trying to analyze this. I don't know how they run their own shop, but I don't know how they run it. Now. For sure. I was trained enough in sales, and I feel like there's a lot of guys that are missing some basic things, and I feel like everybody, this is too different. Like, things. like people in your employee, or? No, 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 I, I work for myself, and I'm just, you know, I'm starting on my own business. Okay. Not, but I've been hung around shop, and so like, he, he's an artist, but he works in shop local with me. Mm -hmm. um, this is really two completely separate things. This is like a love of an art, mm -hmm. but it's traditional sales. What she's talking about right there, that's like, if, like if everyone's here is not going to regular traditional sales tactics in their shop, yeah. you have tax. Absolutely. It's like regular stuff. It's yeah. just basic structures everyone should mm -hmm. have. I, mean, I just figure that's noteworthy. I'm trying to get myself started, but I feel like yeah, There's so much that we stuff. learn from traditional retailing businesses like you yeah. know, Saks or Dillard's and yeah, like we're in that space. What she's talking about, I think like everybody should be doing stuff like that, you know, if they have a big shop. So, Agreed. So I just want to weigh my opinion if someone's new to this. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. They might push customers away. Yes. It's, yeah. it's actually so that's probably there's worse. There's that balance of mm -hmm. oh, absolutely. They can feel like they're on a car lot. But not hardcore. Like what he was talking about, it's like, you know, it takes these guys to show news and that, like, that's perfect. It's like, or like, it's not about Well, that's education. Like, yeah, it's perfect. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it makes sense, you can write it off. Employee anniversaries, they're important. Remember like when your employees here, started? You know, every, take every take every everyone show. out for Christmas dinners, like, try to. You know, treat your employees kind of with family, but you know, stay in that guidelines of where they're not going to be like, hey, can I get an extra bonus this week because I really need it, or you know, try not to be too good for friends. And make sure to bring receipts to your account. Or yeah, like Cracker, 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 Cracker Barrel. Barrel. Hey, here goes Cracker Barrel. Anybody? I love the hell out of Cracker Barrel. <laughs> it's just dope. <laughs> um, 
Well, like they got those aprons, and for how many years they're there, they get a star. And, and almost every time I go in, I don't see anybody with two stars or one star. So I mean, like, they must have a good program because there's three, four, and five stars on everybody's apron, you know. Um, yeah, it, it's, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's good to keep employ good employees. I guess that's the point. Well, the next one then? Um, we ready? Promotion, social media, pictures, Yelp, Google Maps, Headshot Finder. That's on you, sir. I think this is definitely one of the toughest things over the last five or six to ten years to figure out where to put money for promotion. I mean, there's so many different avenues out there from Facebook to Instagram to paint for it to magazines to. Uh, yeah, and it, the list goes on, but out of this, what's very important what I found, go on and look at the local store and see where, like type in their name, look at all what comes up. If it, they come up on Yelp, they come up on some weird site, add your name to that site too. Like get on there. Everything, there's so many different apps out there that everyone's on different things. Find out every single app that there is and get your address on there. Get your name listed, Google listings, headshot finders, all that stuff. It's very, very important. It's free. You just got to go on there, research and find all the apps and actually put your name in there. I mean, it's, it's free. Do it. It's my, huge. My brother owns a smoke shop in East Texas. And it's a college shop. And um, what he does is he incentivizes the people to actually like follow him on social media when he makes the sale. And if they'll follow him and give him a good review, then he hands them a 10% on your next purchase or 20% off your next purchase, you know, situation. And that shit works out. My brother's five freaking stars with like 186 different reviews. And it's legit. And his shop's been open a year. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, you know, you, uh, again, you have to incentivize people, I think, you know. Our Lyft driver does. Got 15 bucks to take us to the pop shop before we came to the hotel. <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, like you need to stop and get yeah, bought. They're like, of course. Yeah, Lyft, 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 Uber, Uber yeah. all those taxi services. If you can get a friend in there, anything like that, have them give them 10% off flyers and just have them give them every person in town because that and really it's free. You know, you maybe kick the Uber driver a pipe or something, but he loves it forever. Yeah. Another thing that's not free necessarily, but very beneficial is rewards programs. Yeah. Um, we use Five Star, which is a pretty common rewards program for small businesses and many retail outlets. Um, and it's extremely beneficial. It rewards the people who spend, the more money you spend, the more you get rewarded. Uh, everybody wants to be a part of it, they want to get points, they want to build their accounts, and, and, and they do. And it's free one flyer miles. Yeah, and it, it, it also allows you to run promotions. So, um, you know, once they sign up for it, they put their phone number in, and for ours, it's all through text messaging. If we feel like for whatever reason, maybe we're at a slump, maybe it's a slow month, we're like, all right, look, time to do a sale. You throw 25% out in the mass text, and we don't do it too often because you don't want to annoy them, but we throw out that mass text and it brings people in the door. Sure as shit, it, like within an hour or two of that text going out, all of a sudden, the business picks up, it's noticeable. Nice. Anybody in here have anything to add to that as far as different incentivizing programs y'all might have to build sales? And this was on promotions, right? But radio advertising, you know, yeah, that's one thing. Oh, yeah. And then, you know, radio advertising does really well. I mean, I'm, I'm in Eugene where some of the coolest head shops, you know, back, back in the day are there. And, uh, yeah, they definitely, they definitely have that. I think another thing that I'd love to see before I had shop this, a lot of shops in Eugene would do a 420 party and they would have a, a glass blower there doing a live demo. Demo. There's so many people doing that would come in to do a live demo. Like when I was young, man, I would have just loved to have been there. You wouldn't have to be How many shops here so, look at glass blowers that would do live demos? Please, raise your hands. For those of you not raising your hands, it is immense. You know, it's educational. It builds value. It shows people that this shit's not easy. We're not just spitting these things out. Like, it's a truly integral part of it, you know? It's fascinating and, and it's an entertainment. You know, it's really entertaining. And some of these people that come and blow glass, I was trained by a Walt Disney glass board. Right. So that's what they did. You know, they, they talk to the customer, tell them what they're doing, and it really gets people involved. And I just think it's something that, 
every head shop should probably do that once annually every year. Oh, and when you do it every year, it builds up and people know the next year and the next year. And then you do a bong giveaway or whatever. And people are like, oh, I'm coming down there to get that bong. And 25 people show up. We would always refer to it as edutainment. You know, like you're entertaining and you're educating. And when you educate, then they're going to come by more. They're going to see the value of it. And it really I, helps that the relationship with that glass blower, right? Because you're helping them get some exposure. So they're going to want to like hook you up. You know? Yeah, I would say too, like if you're going to do one event a year, find what I would call your hometown hero. If the glass blower that's local to you, that has been doing it the longest, has the best following, and try and set something up annually with that person. Uh, and you're gonna, they're going to grow a collector base, and their collector base is going to come to you because you're the go-to shop for that person. So, also okay. events in general, right? Not yeah, demos, but events. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. In, in the room, what are some of your all's most uh, popular in, events to keep the thing moving? 420, because you need to have that same weekend every year so people remember it a lot easier. Right. It's the yeah, easier. Yeah, I mean, the Blaze and Ace in Portland Bay do the thing with KGB because yeah. of Donuts. They do Donut Fest. Donut Fest. It's been running like five years strong and people come from like North Carolina and yeah. Portland, you know? Yeah. This is just this little event in Portland Bay every year because it's, it's ridiculous. Yeah. Okay, moving on. How to diminish loss, risk management, how many of you all think that that's kind of a pretty big deal, right? You know, let's not fool ourselves. People steal shit. It happens. And break shit. Yeah, you know? So, you know, setting your shop up for a win is like, you know, it's, it's a super thoughtful thing that you can do. Um, not just with the way that you hire people or not just where you place your cameras, but also how you integrate your vertical merchandising. You know, I mean, we're coming into where, like, it's super competitive. Y'all know better than, or as, as well as we do, like, it's a super competitive space at this point. How many new shops have opened up in your town in the last two to three years? You know? Six. A lot. Um, so, you know, bringing your game up to pro with merchandising and with managing your risk management is, like, a huge part of your, uh, your bottom line, getting your profits right. Yes? Has anybody here done anything like super progressive or thoughtful as far as risk management? Yeah, fire. Hiring, hiring process? The prosecute. Prosecute? I mean, I was just, I was just gonna say like, uh, you know, I mean, even, even it goes back to like employees, uh, when they, when you're arranging a shelf, the risk management is you know that they have to clean that shelf, you the shop owner knowing that they're gonna go in there and try to make sure that you're putting your super heady pieces not next to a piece, you know. It's definitely, I've had employees that are just come in and hung over in the morning and they fucking break a piece. What the heck do you do? You know what I mean? You get to a point where you gotta fire them at some point, but I mean, it's kind of on you too to arrange them in a way where they're not gonna break it that easy, that it's actual, you know, protecting yourself too. Mm -hmm. I think just don't leave yourself open too. Be at the top of your game. Don't. Yeah. Someone else is going to come into your town and try not to beat you. They better have a half million dollars behind yeah. them because yeah. you're running at the top of your game. Exactly. Don't leave the door open for someone to 
be like, oh, I'm the only game in town and I can slack on something. If you see any spots that you're not dominating at, you better step it up and don't, don't leave that door open for anyone else to come in. And well, they are going to put, they gotta put a lot of money in. They're going to put a lot of money in to not make that much money, most likely. You know, so. and at that point, you're not so concerned like if somebody's just popping up a, a creating joint, you know, like just making their money off consumables, yeah. you know. Um, but that's just, kind of your, your creative business, though. Yeah. Well, I know as an artist, like, <laughs> whenever I send something out as far as production work goes, we try to include, like, one or two items extra when we know it's a fairly breakable item. Right. Um, and I'd love to hear you guys' opinion on, like, from a store side when you receive that kind of stuff. I know it's not exactly really what you're talking about, but, but yeah, we try to send out a little bit of extra coverage for, yeah. for situations like that. Um, same way you were saying, like stacking shelves where you can actually access Those them. guys would be awesome to do that. Yeah, I don't want to do that. It's definitely, uh, you know, it's hard for a lot of people to do that um, just because they package it so well. And I mean, that comes back also to like when I ship shit all the time. It, it's hard sometimes for the new shops are like, dang, did that shit really break? It's like, comes down to it. Like, I had a shop that uh, for some reason, only stuff broke every year in their box. And I'm like, okay, so yeah, this is yeah, kind of tricky yeah. and like that has happened to me before. And I'm like, dang, that's and I just don't deal with them anymore. So yeah, people, right. Yeah. yeah, some people are really bad at packing glass, so make sure like your employees <laughs> like show them how to pack glass. Like yeah. uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to it's not yeah, to be comfortable around it. Yeah. 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 Well another part of that is uh, another topic that we have is like actually encouraging and I promise, I respect y'all's time, and I know y'all got more fucking vendors clawing at you and calling you 450 times a month than ever before. But the opportunity to uh, build those relationships and actually have the glass blower come in and you handpick that glass, you know? And in communication with the glass blower, like one of the, I mean, one of my best friends, who was also the biggest critic and asshole of like my glass game, and I also learned the most from it was Big Mike. I don't know if anybody here remembers him. And he was the one that, like, in my brain, you do three cards on the left and you do one on the right because there's fucking people out there that are left handed. Like, you know, simple things. And, and it really, you know, in the game that we're all in, 15% or 12% or even 9% is not a small number. It's a huge, huge mover. I asked so many glass blowers for a flat mouthpiece. Right. It's just, and, and they have their own interpretation of what that means, but like, <laughs> It comes out locked out like a square mouthpiece sometimes, but just like just a flat mouthpiece. Like everything's a round hole at the end, you know. And just yeah. like just change the tongs in there, give a flat mouthpiece. You'd be surprised how many people want that. And I asked us for it over and over again, just like give me well, one order of flat mouthpieces. And it doesn't really. The ones that respond are the ones you want to keep working exactly, with. Yeah. Most of my artists, I have them uh, making. You know, if they're doing a fifty run, twenty five of them are flat mouthpieces. Or not, because there's so many shops. Every shop wants something different, and I try to make sure to have what they want. You know, flat mouthpieces are a huge thing. Everyone wants that clinch. And there's so many shops that are like, "Oh my gosh, I haven't seen this never." And I'm like, "Wait, there's people that don't do this." Yeah. Do this eight in 23 years. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, how many people here? You know, like of the shops. Again, how many shops are in here? Raise your hand again. Okay. Out of all of you all, how many people actually entertain local glass blowers to bring by product in, in, into your shop and you handpick stuff? So, most. It's an excellent way to build um, your local following, you know, to build the faithfulness of the consumer. They can go anywhere to go buy blunt wrap, they can go anywhere to go buy their craton, you know. Um, you offering these individual items that they're not going to find in another shop is what sets you apart and brings that customer back for more than just the consumable, you know? Yeah, uh, there's a shop. Oh, do uh, you have a question? Go ahead. Uh, it's actually so a few years ago, I worked at a different shop that actually allowed the employees to pick pieces as well. You can call. And Whoa, you can nice. That's, that's awesome. They that's shops, cool. And you can yeah. call the inventory manager and say, okay, like 50.5% and specifically the, the, uh, the purchasing manager wasn't there. He said, okay, this person just came over the table this last. Do I have a limit? And they'll give you like, okay, you can get $200 worth of stuff and you're just in a picture of what you think is the one you're doing. I like that. I like that a lot, especially right now. Well, they're the ones selling it. Right. Yeah, it, it's nice to let them go ahead and pick out a con. I'm not 
not saying like let them do the buy, but you know, if this slow up front, like, hey, come on back and I want four of these, go ahead and pick out your four favorite. Like, yeah, it's, I, I love that because the employee next time they'll come back with like a sold all those four pieces. Like, right, right away because they were so excited to pick them up. Training at that job, somebody just happened to come in and I thought it was like the coolest thing ever. Yeah. Yeah. My, first, my first experience in that job, they're like, oh, why, why don't you pick pieces? Well, especially if you, you know, as we were talking about earlier, hiring passionately, you know, these, I, I promise you, I hardly even dress myself. Like, I listen to shop owners so much. I listen to the salespeople on how we should develop our new designs because, to be honest, I'm old school as fuck. I've been going the last 23 years. I, I don't know what's hot. I'm relying on you all. And I'm glad to institute that into my design so that we all do better, you know. I think it's important to have every every one of your employees too to have what their favorite piece in the shop is because that's always asked. So, what's your favorite piece in the shop right now? You know, and everyone has something in their head. Oh, I hope they see matter if it's a thousand dollar piece or a thirty dollar piece. But like, <laughs> yeah, I think there's, there's such a difference between shops that like where the owner collects or the or at least the employees collect than shops where they're just all business. Yeah. Uh, one of my favorite shops who supported me for years and had been local roots. They done it right because like you just mentioned having the artist's favorite piece and they have a certain screen on the wall that should have the artist of the month and then it's their favorite strains or their items of their pieces and they would just they always get their employees involved with it. Okay. Yeah it shows the person not only having them like, being expressed what they like but training on how to sell that stuff is really important. And I guess yeah. something that I always thought was like lacking because we have all these food stores opening up and want to buy a glass but 90% of customers don't actually sell sell stuff. Like, why this heading piece is cooler than that? I mean, to, to integrate American glass art into your shop, you should have a passion about it. Otherwise, it's not totally going to work out for you. You know, like, you need to be in the game because you love the game. We don't make 10 centimes. I, I try not to. I will if I am running a little low on the ramen. Yeah. Um, I just want to make a one point before we move on. Um, there's a shop up in Maine, perfect example of a shop that kind of, they're actually like up in Belfast, Maine, which is far off the, the beaten path for most people buying glass in Maine, yet yeah, they're selling the most glass in Maine because they're in tune with the local community that they buy the most from local glass blowers. They dedicate shelves to local glass blowers. So the main tags up. And, she, and she's a collector, like the other shops, a lot of the other shops in town, they're, they're just kind of, uh, they're not collectors. They're yeah. just, they're just not good reason. So you can tell. You can tell that they, they lack the passion for like the, you know, all that stuff. And, and she gets it. She has the, um, you know, the the product as well as the headies, you know. And so she she gets that she has to have all that. And she runs it herself. But she's also like uh, she has this hashtag Stay Lifted 207. And she was already kind of an influence in the community well before she started that. And so it was a natural progression for her to do that. And so because it was so organic and authentic she automatically became very trusted by the collectors and she works with them you know she shows she shows them that she works with them and she gives them deals and does all that stuff and goes the extra mile and it's crazy because she's not in the location you know they say location 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 but she's not in a location that could kill it but somehow she does it because online and just through the vibe of her shop it's like wow you really care about this you know showing you care goes a long way yeah i mean real collectors are don't mind driving, they don't mind destination spots, and that's part of the excitement. You know, if, you, if you're within driving distance of something that, that's really intriguing, you're gonna get in your car when you have a free day. Yeah. Right? And, that's, and they wanna meet the Stokes family, uh, not it's, just the whoever shop. Totally. It's, you guys are like a family, and you, you all like take care of each other, and you can see that in the posts. Yeah, I mean, you know, any person who walks through the door, you gotta, you know, this is the service, the service industry, and we come from a restaurant background originally, we, we take that pretty seriously, that same type of, uh, uh, of greeting, of service. Like people walk through the door, you want to say hi to them within minutes of walking through the door. But if someone comes from really far away, they get a little extra treatment. You know, We're going to walk them through the studio, we're going to introduce them to, the, to our resident glass blowers, we're going to show them uh, a little bit more than we would, and, and they're going to come back you know, the next time they have free time. Would you? Would you say that there's like a certain curation? It's hard for me because I'm not from the store side or the artist side, but would you say there's like a certain curation for the stores as far as that collector market versus the walk-in? 
sale. Probably be right. unique, right? Be like more unique. Than well, sure, you want. I mean, you want to be unique. Well, it's just it differs. Work, it, it differs for every shop. Okay, fair. You know, it differs for every shop. Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. A uh, question for shop owners. What kind of feedback are you getting from female buyers? What kind of colors, styles, right. uh, functionality are they looking for? Right. Because that's a segment of the population that's actually making more money and has more disposable income. Which yes. Yeah. Go girl power. It actually makes 70% of consumer decisions like on, in the aisles. So, yeah. Uh, that, that, that's a really tough question to answer. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, their taste varies just as much as, as men's do, and, and you know you're gonna get some guys who, who like feminine things, and some guys who like more masculine things, and the same thing with women. So it's kind of hard to put your finger on it, um, but we do make a point to diversify like the the selection in terms of it being you know masculine to feminine and everything in between. Um, but not necessarily with a sex, the sex of the buyer involved. It's more about the taste. But you know, I, the one thing is, it's cool in town. I've got a lot of bead makers there in Eugene, and I have a booth at the oldest market in the country where I got pipes passed there. It took 30 years until me and Glasscraft, Dave Winship, got together and we passed it down there. So I can sell pipes out of my booth. And so that's when I got a radio app, and I saw how it affected, and I thought, Man, and I, I don't really sell a lot of pipes to stores, so my situation, that's my head shop. I have the number one spot in Eugene. Every, and I'm glad I pointed this out. Everybody knows in Eugene, Eli's right on this corner. I've been there almost 20 years. I rolled into Eugene, and one of the first things I did was I went to Saturday Market, and I think it's the one time in the last six months this fucker wasn't there. So I, I, make, I make a lot of pipe sales. So yeah, I sell a lot of monster pipes to dudes and yeah, I do a lot of pipes that are like girly and flowers and little frogs and stuff like that for women. It's a standard for me. I, I hit both sides. I always have tried to hit both sides of the market on that. I think it's super important because women are going to buy way different clothes than men. We all know that. It's a kind of a no-brainer for that. So yeah, I think identifying that, really having that woman product or you know that female product is a huge necessity. Yeah, I mean, I've even in. Uh I feel like there's been a lot of times when a girl was looking specifically for a girl-made piece, and I think that's very important too to have, you know, the 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 difference there because I mean there was a lot a lot of times when I just got asked, hey, do you have any girl glass blower stuff in there? And I'm like, yeah, you know, I mean, it's, it's one that's I guess that's, that's the only point. time that I really Yeah, it's a, that's a really good point. You know? Like, uh, you know, as far as like, like pendants go, for example, we sell a ton of juju pendants. To women, right um, Yeah, yeah. There you go. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, she, she makes she makes a product that appeals to men and women. But um, you know, she, look at her shirt. She just walked in with that stoked. There you go. <laughs> that's not, that's not She's our she's our manager. Um, you didn't have to say that. It could just have been random. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've never seen her before. Yeah. Um, but uh, but yeah, the female artist thing is a really good point. You know. Women like to support women, and for good reason. So that's well, female artists, for the most part, are so meticulous. Like you get to see a different class of work from. Really do. You know, we were talking earlier, but the women in glass. I mean, that blew my ass away, and a lot of us. This is really cool. I mean, that doesn't happen in every industry. Football, you know, you know, it, it happens in a lot, but it, it's not. It, we, we could sit here and people would start saying I'm, I'm a sexist maybe or whatever it is, but you know, there's things that women do in glass, it's a dangerous thing. It is so impressive. I'm so proud of the women that are in glass. It's unreal compared to other industries for me. Right. It's like, yeah, you know, you can get women in cake, making cakes and shit, probably better than men. But to me, that was, doing that glass. Was, that was sexist. <laughs> <laughs> I'm calling that out. But yeah, what, what I'm trying to say, what I'm trying to say is that Go make me a sandwich. Glass just blow some of these men away, and That's it's just it's super, super, super cool. Um, well, one other thing that, like, we, we've gone over most of the topics here, and it was something that we didn't have down, so I'm just going to fucking call out an audible here, is um, y'all guys don't talk enough amongst each other, in my opinion. 
like there's some forums on Facebook and everything like the people in this room aren't in competition you know and there's so much that we can all learn from each other and as glass blowers, we were brought up kind of like on the dead lot and we we're all smoking weed and we we're all pretty cool with each other we knew each other's families and so like once we got past a certain point of trust then I think that's one of the reasons that glass blowing evolved so quickly was because we became more collaborative and less competitive and I, like, I don't know if it should be an organization or what but like y'all guys have so much to learn from each other it's becoming right. such a competitive space that I really would encourage you all to to try to bond together and put this, something to where y'all can learn from each other. I mean Stokes and Witch Doctor are a perfect example they, they re-shout each other out all the time like it's it's hmm. they each have a show going on they'll shout each other out I mean they're three hours away, but they have a lot of the same collectors. And you'll, I can go to a Stoke and Witch Doctor show, and they'll see a lot of the same people just hanging out and enjoying it. It's awesome that they're sharing the collector perspective. You know what I mean? They're not being like, no, I don't want to shout that shout out because fuck, I might lose a person. They're sharing each other's times, and it's freaking amazing to see that. Because like, they're, they're supporting the scene. Yeah. They're not like, oh, it's all about me. Like, no, no, it's not well, and I promise you that as the space grows, you all are going to be in competition with much more efficient machines, much more efficient vehicles, people who have been retailing for fucking 50 years, and they're just straight fucking venture capitalists, and they're looking for the bottom line, and they got their shit down pat. So, like, for those of you who love it and are in it because your heads and you actually love, you know, what we all do for a, a living, um, we we have to keep together. We have to keep making steel sharp, steel sharp and steel. Right? Is that the yeah. saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah steel yeah. sharp and steel. All there you go. Yeah, yeah. So I would encourage more collaborative effort between you all shop owners to help each other out. One of the questions I came in here really wondering was like, you know, the heady sales, and that's been something that uh, I I started. I bought my shop from uh, someone that already had it going as a really undercapitalized business in my town. You know, I bought it for like- Those emotional purchases. $28,000 not knowing anything about retail or yeah. any of that stuff. And like getting into it and uh, starting to buy headies. I had, I had traded for a piece. I had a banjo, dope banjo piece on the shelf, not labeled as banjo, for $435 for five years. <laughs> so I took it up to the couple of glass gatherings and was like- At zero. Started asking people around and it was like, hey, who's this? I'm talking to Banjo. I was like, I'd like oh. to see the rest of your class. He's like, oh, man. Yeah, right. She oh, might want to oh, purchase one of those 435 oh, pieces. He's looking at it. He's like, oh, I'm like, you know, man. He's like, oh, yeah, I made this. It's probably like 2007 or, you know, something. But like, no one bought that. He was the, you could tell it was early heady with horns and it was crazy. And it, it had his signature triple little wig wag in one thing. And I should have noticed that. But I, I buy headies and then I'm like, if I, I put them online, people are like, how much is the price of that um, snake? You know, oh, it's this, and crickets, you know, like, am I charging too much? What is, I don't want to, I don't want to offend a glass blower by charging it too little for something and buying something for 2500 bucks and selling it for 3200 and trying to make $700 on it, yet I can't keystone that, I can't sell it for five grand, no one's going to buy it. One thing, one thing I, I think that, you know, as far as, sorry to interrupt, but as far as, like, you know, high-end sales go, your margin should kind of stay the same, if, ideally, but instead of giving major discounts, try and avoid that and include a lot of stuff. You know, I mean, you're gonna you, we'll yeah, include a we'll include right. a pelican, we'll include a banner, right. uh, we'll include a ring mat and, and our swag shirt, all that stuff. Um, whatever you can throw yeah, in it, because you could say 4K, or you could say 4K heli. Banger, yeah. all, you know, 4K. It sounds way better, right? And, and the other thing is, those crickets, you're gonna get tons of those. Yeah, because people just, just do that. They just do that. It's part of our job to be okay. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. it's part of our job is to entertain a million fucking angry. That's the deal. For sure. I mean, I'm not. Doesn't doesn't spend me here. Yeah, it's just, I, get, I get annoyed too. I'm like, God. Boy, damn it. I, I, <laughs> another <laughs> thing that I don't used to do, and like some artists, it's unattainable. It's not reasonable to hope for this, but you know, like. When we sell a heady, it, it's more of a, a centerpiece that's surrounded by some more affordable, attainable work by the same artist. Right. So, like, you know, I would encourage you all don't bank on that heady, but if you do support that artist's creativity by buying that heady, then kind of try to, hey, brother, that's beautiful, man, but let me also get, I need to get 10 of your pieces that are under this so that I can do 
that. And that's, that's like classic psychology is framing, like what's the most expensive piece in your store? Is it, if it's 40K, then uh, 40 It brings everything else up around it. Rig, sure. it's correct. Yeah, not that much to, yeah. yeah, yeah. So so let that be a centerpiece, you know, and let it support other work around it. But I mean, is there ever a point where you're like, someone sells you something and is an artist offended that you so, yeah. so like, you're gonna offend. You're gonna offend artists all the time. We're just offending all the time. Okay. Um, uh, I'm, I don't know. I'm just in a place where I'm not. I don't have like super set prices. But um, that shop in Maine, Riptide, that sells all of my work. She does that because she doesn't do a huge markup on it. Now, the it's tricky because I don't want to screw my other stores over. You know what I mean? Who, who are like, well, this is the margin I need to get. And so, you know, I kind of work with her, and I'm like, okay. You know, I'll I'll hook you up because you're buying you know 15 grand worth of stuff from me. You know, and I'll give you a discount so that you already know you're already 10 percent in. You know what I mean? And you, you've already got like if you sold it at the price I sold it to you, you still made a little bit of money. You know what I mean? That kind of thing. Um, and just I don't know. I just try to like I'm not offended myself because I'd rather it moved. I'd rather it got to someone's collection and then they were posting it on Instagram, they're posting the shop they bought it from, they're posting the artist. She's happy. I'm happy. Um, if, if I had a problem, I would just explicitly talk to her about it. I think that's on the artist to do, you know. Communication works. Right. I think it's a good yeah. thing to, that you could educate your artists is that we talked about it earlier. It's free enterprise. You would send, when I sell somebody something, it doesn't matter who it is. They sell for what they want. I have people that sell for three times the amount or 2.5 or 2. And if someone even does it less, you know, that's their option. It's their store. It's, like I said, free enterprise. Once you sell somebody something, they can sell for whatever they want. We, we can suggest, you know, like... But that's all we can do. Sometimes, sometimes you have a high end piece. You know that there's a reason why it's going to be a difficult sale, um, and so you're going to have to mark it down in order to get it moved. The one thing that I stay away from, we stay away from, is is posting that on social media. Mm -hmm. Like you know, we won't say we're selling this for this significantly no. discounted. Yeah. 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 But we, we will say, you know, we could say it's going for a steal, but you're not being specific. You're not saying I'm selling this $5,000 piece for $2,500. And I, I see you over there, yeah. if I can make one point real quick. Yeah, go ahead. Um, if you feel like you need to make a 2.5 or a 3%, 300% markup on this thing, and you're really solid on that, but it, there are cycles in the glass world. There's shit that's fucking hype, and it's in that moment, and it's gonna last five months, or it's gonna like six months, and then it's gonna start fading. Don't try to achieve that margin and screw yourself out of this window of, of where something's pretty relevant, you know? Like, understand that it's relevant. I know it's not gonna be relevant forever, so I, I wanna get this gone before it's stale. Yeah, get it out of there. It's, you, nobody here needs dust collectors at all. Well, and like people who are going to come to your shop and they're going to see all this like turnover and be like, oh, oh that piece is not here anymore. Yeah. Well, That's shit. Can I tell the salt story again? Yeah. And uh, like, all right, so one of my homeboy down in Austin, fucking super great guy. He's got three head shops down there. And he had two salt pieces. One of them was black, one of them was white. They're both starfish. They're like, you know, early work. Super, you know, not super expensive, but pretty expensive. And he was going through, he was cleaning his cases. When he cleaned the cases, he moved both the pieces down to a shelf below that was like not a visible shelf. It's like one of those storage shelves underneath your case and dusted it all off. And then he put one case up there and he was stoned as fuck. He forgot to put the other case up there. That very same day, within hours, somebody came in and they were like, oh, holy shit, I've been looking at those pieces for months and you sold one of them. Fuck, I'm taking that one right now. Yeah. Psychology. Mix it up, you know? Like, come on. I know, I know as an artist, one of the more difficult things with the production stuff that we were talking about in the previous seminar with uh, doing wholesale stuff like that uh, is that 100% markup. So we've been trying to, like, you know, leave 100% markup for us. Keystone. Keystone. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. And a lot of stores are very receptive of it, and a lot of stores want more than that. So A lot of stores sell a lot more consumables that get more of a three to 500% markup, and so they're kind of used to that. Yeah, right. You, and, and you have to understand saying, their business model also. That, so you have to understand their business model also. Of course, right, yeah. yeah, yeah. When it comes to headies versus production versus, it, it, it's, it feels like it's such a responsibility as an artist to be able to provide that opportunity for them versus trying to negotiate what it is that they're actually going to sell or you know how much they need. Or like you were saying before, dropping that market down a little bit just to be able to move 
you know, keep, keep things going. And stuff right. Like that, I know? think that mentality of like quadrupling off a handbike is like five or seven years old. It's way old. We, or it's China. We don't, yeah, or China. Yeah. 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 We don't yeah you do, do that shit with some import. We buy a ten dollar bike and we sell it for twenty dollars, maybe twenty two. I mean, I still see a lot of shops that I go to and I'll sell them a fourteen dollar handpipe and that fucking thing's marked at thirty five bucks and I'm like I, I mean no, that's, that's, that's okay, that's but you know, and then I see another piece in there that I sold and that's marked lower and it's, it's, it, I guess it's kind of all to the shop's perspective, but when I go in there, I want to be like, hey, can you lower that a little bit and move a bunch of these? Here's a couple extra ones, you know? Because I want my glass to move in the shop. So, like, when I come in and I see that price, I'm like, lower this down, here's a couple extra, just to try to get those to move, because I want to see my pieces move in your store. Yep. And I know you want to make money, too, so I'm trying to give you that extra piece so you can lower the piece and just flash it out. If y'all run a sale, I'll match you on my next sale to you with that same discount. Something like that. Keep everything fresh. But on Eddie's, we're not talking Keystone. Dude, Eddie's right? is such an individual thing. thing. When, I, when, I, when I owned the store, everything over $700, I, I did like 60%, 60 to 80%. When it got over to $700 wholesale, there was no doubling. I mean, that's no. just where that's just where I was at. You know, I was trying to move Eddie's, and I just I just wanted to fly them off. The people I made sure I was selling it's it's like, by the next. Yeah, the balance of like, do I buy a $3,000 pipe so I can sell it for $4,000 real quick? Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's the limit. Push your smart way to $200 or $4,000 out the door. Yeah, $3,400 and just get it moved. Yeah. yeah, and like it took up this much real estate or you had it for a couple of days and it's just four hundred dollars market. Okay. And then, you know, like maybe the customer knows you're hooking them up on an individual level, maybe not, you're not advertising on social media or something, but I think uh, it's over. Post a picture of that customer holding that thing, smiling their ass off on Instagram, like the Eddie Murphy show. Story, story. <laughs> you know. Right, right, sold. Yeah. All right, we talked about a lot of things here. Um, are there any subject matters that we didn't hit upon that y'all would like to talk about? Anyone? I think uh, Stoke should reach on to be honest with artists regarding the pricing and quality. I mean, that's a, that's a difficult one. You know, it, it's, it's there's so much but hurt in this topic. Uh, you know, I don't know, especially for for newer shop owners, you know, it's um, it's intimidating. You know, you you see somebody who's putting their heart and soul into this work. You know, that they're the only person making it. There's not you know necessarily an assembly line there. Um, so it's very personal to them, and so it's you know it's tough because you you don't want to offend somebody, but at the same time, uh, you need to be honest because it's the only way they're going to grow. Um, and also, if you bend over and you just feel bad and you're going to buy it anyway, you then you're getting shitty product. Screwing yourself over. Yep. Um, you know, but here's the obvious things to look for if you're looking at a water pipe. You want to make sure that gallon stem goes to, to where it needs to be in that pipe. You, you know how what it, what it needs to function. Um, uh, let's see what else. We're I mean, about. sometimes on that topic too, uh, if they're coming in and asking 20 bucks on a hand pipe and you think it's worth 14. Probably just say pass, you know, don't be like, oh, I'll give you 14 for it, because that's a pretty hurtful difference. But, you know, I'll try to be honest with them at a point, you know, just don't shatter their yeah, dreams. Or you can figure it out and say, okay, I need to adjust. Yeah, yeah. it's, it's constructive criticism. Yeah. You know, I'd love to know what I'm doing wrong. Yeah. And they never tell me. It, it's, tough. Tough. it's tough for oh, stores sometimes yeah. just to be that honest. I mean, well, there's, just, there's, there's, ways, there's ways to approach it. There's ways to approach it, like really for, for that particular style, I'm, I'm really only in about the $14 range. You're not telling them I can only give you $14 for that, you just let them know, like, right. in that area, that's about where I got, you know? Communication is key, man, that's everything. One, one thing I sometimes do is, uh, you know, if somebody breaks open their case and let's say they've got a bunch of wrapping ring spoons, maybe they're fume wrapping ring spoons, um, and I feel the price point is a little bit high, maybe the shaping isn't perfect, they've got a few things to work on. I'll bring them over to my spoon case and I'll pull out a few things that are similar and just show them. They can take a look at it and they can take a look at the price points and then they can kind of go from there. Um, I'm not necessarily suggesting that they should lower their price, but I'm just showing them. And, and, and I'll tell them too, like this is what we got it for. Yeah, that, that might push them out of the spoon game. Yeah. Could be great. Oh, I don't make inside out for anything anymore. I'm like, oh, you get that twelve dollars? Fucking order more shit from him. I'll make something else. I promise. Yeah. Yes, please. One thing I'm gonna tell you that the girls do, the girl glass lovers. If 
I'd ask them to send stickers along with whatever. Oh, y'all are always over the bathtub. Come on. You know, put the sticker right on your pipe. The girl glass blowers always they send do stickers. They do it. Yep. The guys are like, uh, they don't, they're like not organized with the pipe. I can tell you that as a person who's owned a magazine for over 15 years, like the only people that did shit when they said they were going to do shit were the women. Are women in glass issue for the flow? Yeah. I try I try to have all my artists actually send me stickers so that I can include them in with the packages. Like I every single artist I work with, anyone that sends me stickers, they go in the box and they get a smorgasbord of everything. Okay, y'all. Anybody have anything else they'd like to touch touch on? Anything at all? Yeah. Please stand up. Get your inside voice on. Come on. So, just kind of touching back on like advertising and finding the local hometown hero. Like a lot of those guys have you know, ten thousand or more followers, and I see it all the time where a shop I've never heard of scoops a piece up that everybody's been watching the process of. And that's like a gear 10,000 people that all go to your shop's page now because they say, oh, hey, he just picked up this fire, you know? Right. And I don't know, I think a lot of people kind of miss out that direct reaching out to the artist that way and they kind of wait for some of the come bring it by their shop sometimes. Yeah, you can't wait. Well, you Not if you want to be on top of your shit. Yeah. You as the shop should go and talk to the artist and have a relationship with them and be like, hey, if you got something, like, hit me up. I'd love to take a look at it. You know, if you got something fresh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that's where the, the Instagram story actually comes in really handy. If you're following somebody in particular that you have your eye on and you're watching their story, a lot of times you're going to see them working on a piece. You're going to see sections of prep and you're already, you already know it's going in a good direction. You get in their ear before it's even complete. Like, yeah, keep me in the loop with that piece. I want to know what's up. Yeah, and I know someone who bought prep from me. He was like, do you mind if I give this prep to this other glass blower? I was like, as long as that other glass blower knows what to do with it, doesn't screw it all up. I mean, I'll sell you the prep. You know, I'm, I'm happy to do that. And this, this guy's actually getting ahead of the curve. Yeah. He's like, I just want your prep. And I'm going to set your lap up. I've already got this already. I've got a waiting list. That's a shop owner who's asking you for prep. It's, yeah, yeah. He's That's like, smart. Yeah, yeah. Y'all better he's, write that one like, down. Better like, <laughs> write that one down. That's and, some good and shit. He's already like on the bringer, like talking to collectors, like, hey, what would you, would you like this type of lab if I were to set it up? He's, like, he's thinking yes. way of that way, man. You know, and he's, but like, it makes sense. It's like, okay, this artist makes this. This artist does this prep. He knows how glass blowing works. He knows that like, I'm handing the prep over to the guy, and then the guy's turning into a recycler. So it's like, oh shit, I could just make them make that and incentivize the artist to do that. Kind of guarantee the sale on the other end. Talk to my collectors and be like, what would you pay for this? What, you know, and, and work it out. That's pretty smooth. It's awesome. Yeah. 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 I mean, it'd be safe to be able to walk into a head shop and have a prep lined up against the back counter and have to take out. Watch <laughs> out, watch <laughs> out. <now. laughs> <Yay>. <laughs> Sir. As an artist and a buyer for a store, how do we encourage that relationship? Where the to get the stores to reach out to the buyers, uh, half or uh, to the sell to the artists. Depends on the passion of the store. To get the stores to reach yeah. out to the artists. Yeah, to yeah. reach out to the artists. Like uh, so, this guy, uh, his name, uh, he was by the Lightning Glass. I just to set up that was a tech collab, and he he hit me up and was just like, I love your work. I love this. I love that. He's always commenting on my stuff. I don't not like it because the guy buys a lot of glass for me. I'm not feeling like oh, this guy's just always. Where, like, I don't feel like it's a waste of time. I have a relationship with him, and I've never met him in person. But we have this great relationship online, and he's always, you know, hitting me up, and he's always like, hey, let me know what's up with this. I want to be the first. And I'm like, I appreciate that. I will. I'll let you know first before talking to people. And so he's being proactive. I think that's it. You just be proactive. Like, like, really, if anything, use the uniqueness of American made glass to help cycle people into your shop to sell the consumables and the other higher markup items. We're not going to be mad at you for that. Swear to God. 
Shit, harass me, dog. I mean, you have to follow through with the buys and everything because I feel like there's a point too where a lot of shops will just hit up artists and then there's no ever buying. Yeah, I, I totally plan on getting an order. Yeah, I will. But then it's like two, three weeks like, later, you hit them up and they're like, oh man, I just spent all my loot with this guy. You're like, okay, well. All right, speaking of that, spending all that loot, we're going to go ahead and wrap this thing up because I want y'all to have enough time to get some dinner, get your energy back, and go in there and spend a fuck ton of money tonight. <laughs> hey, thank you all, everyone, so much. Thank you for the support. Thank you for supporting American Class. Really appreciate it. We love y'all.